Chapter 9 deals with uh, the tax policy in our nation and our society. And also, uh, we, we spend a little bit of time now looking at income distribution and some of the factors associated with this. This ties in very closely with the, with the previous lecture from Chapter 8 on the development of public policy and how that happens. And so, I, I really do encourage you to see this as, as the sequel chapter to, uh, to Chapter 8. Now, we see taxes really as the basis for much of our social programs, and, and we're going to uh, talk about that some and look at some alternatives to the way we traditionally view that. But uh, if you look in the chart um, it, early in this particular chapter in the text, um, the nations really do vary quite considerably in terms of their effective tax rate. Now, as a percentage of gross domestic product, tax revenues uh, vary in that chart from a high of 48.1% in Denmark to a low of uh, just over 17% in Mexico. Our own um, uh, tax revenue in relation to GT GDP is 24.8%. Now, gross domestic product, I, I believe we mentioned early in this in this uh, course, perhaps it was another course. Uh, gross domestic product is really not a great measure of how well individuals are doing in any particular society, nor is it something that you could compare uh, GDP in the United States to Denmark and and uh, see the you know see a comparison that makes sense because there's a number of factors that really aren't considered in gross domestic product some of the most important things include the fact that the cost of living is not factored into gdp um, gdp is just the sum total of all the goods and services and products i guess that are produced in 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 the united states or in any nation so it doesn't include cost of living uh, nor does it include uh, inflation rates. So, so it really doesn't reflect the living standards of the nation quite as much as um, our leaders might like us to say, to believe when they talk about how our GDP is, is higher under their administration. Now, it, it probably goes without saying that the nations that have, you know, the highest percentage of tax revenues per GDP um, per their GDP, um, have a higher commitment to social welfare programming for for its citizens citizenry. You'll notice that most of the nations of Scandinavia, in particular, and Northern Europe, are in the upper echelons of those of those figures, and that has something to do with to reflect the sort of the social democratic nature of their governments and and the way they tend to the needs of their citizens there. The United States has a much lower taxation rate, and and so our federal government's ability to implement social welfare programs thus is reduced accordingly because of that. Because you have to have money to to uh, you know provide programming. But uh, the the authors point out here and other points in the text that if you if you factor in voluntary charitable contributions and and also employee benefits, that is the value of. Uh, the health care programs that we have, uh, many of us have at least in the middle class uh, uh, through through our employment. Um, when you factor all those things in, uh, our welfare state uh, roughly equals that of the European nations. So it says, however, I want to point out um, that depending upon charitable contributions, depending upon voluntary contributions, is a little bit different than depending upon public monies for a number of different reasons. One of which is, is that the contributions may go up and down, although they, they do that with public policy as well, but probably it's more volatile. And, and also um, private and voluntary organizations can choose who they provide these contributions and services to. And that's something you see much less of um, in, in public programming, not that it's absent, but much less of that. So. Anyway, you know, the, the, the uh, authors like to say that you combine all of the social welfare programs that we have, and, and we're, such, we're not such a harsh um, society when you consider voluntary um, nonprofit and for-profit organizations. I think that's an arguable point, but in any event, that's, that's, our, that's our author's perspective on things. Now, you know, our history in the United States, you go back to the Boston Tea Party and, and the Whiskey Rebellion, which occurred shortly after the nation was uh, was was formed and implemented in 1791. These were these were uh, rebellions by the citizens citizenry against 
taxation by the government and and uh, the idea has always been in the really in the first 150 years or so of, of our nation's history of you know what's good was low taxes and high disposable income uh, the more you have tax taxes of course the less disposable income is at your fingertips unless you choose what where your money goes and so then the Great Depression comes along and, and everybody's picture changes everybody's perceptions change and suddenly uh, we we were well not everybody was uh, jumping up and down about it but it became obvious that the government need to step needed to step in and so our uh, our social welfare state in the United States really was kind of established during the Rose Franklin Roosevelt administration through the New Deal and the Social Security Act and those kinds of programs and while uh, over the years since that time those programs uh, elements of those programs have continued even to this day uh, little by little the the sort of the institutional welfare state has been uh, dismantled particularly by the conservative administrations uh, that have been in Washington but also to a certain extent by some of the democratic more liberally minded administrations as well um, what happens is you know as 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 our nation became more prosperous uh, once again, after the after the depression, and really World War II is the thing a lot of people say really ended the depression, not the New Deal programs. But, but in any event, as as our nation became more uh, more prosperous, then working families became more invested in their own success and kind of saw it as a result of their own efforts, and were were just less interested in in you know the the common wheel, so to speak, you know at W E A L, uh, and uh, really you know, allowed for the gradual reduction in these social programs and, and the taxes that were necessary to support them. 1980, the Reagan revolution, as it is often called, uh, ushered in an era of dramatic changes in tax policy, uh, increases in economic inequalities, and uh, the federal government trying to back away from the, from the provision and control of social services and giving as much of that back to the state as it could through its various ways of providing federal funds. Um, well, the long and the short of it is, and, and you know, although I have a basic uh, understanding of economics, uh, I am no economist, but I can tell you that even though Reagan promised uh, the end of big government, you know, he, he said the government, um, what was it? He said government isn't the solution to our nation's problems. Government is the problem is the way he put it. Uh, and so he wanted, you know, smaller federal government and, and uh, you know, to get the government off the backs of its working citizens and all those kinds of things. And uh, what happened in any way as a result of all this, uh, even though he insisted he was cutting back on government services, was the national debt just skyrocketed. I mean skyrocketed during his administration. And it continued during the George H.W. Bush administration, who, uh, although there was some emphasis of on vol volunteerism, uh, his thousand points of light uh, speech, um, is an example of that, you know, that his his uh, administration really carried on with a lot of Reagan's programs. Bill Clinton comes into office. He's elected George H.W. Bush isn't reelected to a, a second term. And a lot of people think largely because of the fact that the economy was was suffering um, in the in the early 1990s. And uh, Clinton gets elected. And uh, he is a social progressive, and he has a lot of ideas ab about social change and social social programming. Um, but they have to get set aside. One of them, of course, was as I have mentioned in previous lectures, was the the uh, national health insurance program that uh, they he and his his uh, his first lady Hillary Clinton tried to get implemented during during the early 90s that it you know just didn't materialize and long and the short of it was there were a lot of other pressures uh, this is when the re the Republican revolution occurred in the, the midterms of his f midterm elections in his first term in office and and uh, we got a very conservative Congress and um, in addition the uh, chief of the Council and Economic Advisors uh, Alan Greenspan, who's kind of a famous figure in, in financial history, if you know anything about economics, I guess. Uh, Greenspan convinced Clinton that he needed to hold back on some of these big social programs because he said the economy couldn't absorb the extra expenses that, that he was proposing. And so uh, 
that along with, I think, a very conservative Congress that was opposed to a lot of uh, expansion of, of services kind of pushed Clinton into the position where uh, he went along with that and really withheld, uh, you know, kind of put off his social investments, I guess. I'm not sure they ever really got implemented as much as he would have liked. Um, and the result of that was, as Greenspan predicted, there was this great economic expansion um, and this eliminated the, I mean, totally eliminated the federal debt. The federal government had no debt and, in fact, had a surplus when Clinton left office uh, in the year uh, 2001 after the 2000 elect, uh, elections. Some say that, that that economic boom had a lot to do with the tech industry kind of taking hold as well and, and all the wealth that was being spread around in, in, uh, in that particular part of the industry. But uh, uh, in any event, you know, when, when Clinton left office, the nation was in perhaps one of the best financial situations that had been in in a long, long time. Um, George W. Bush comes into office, the compassionate conservative, uh, elected in, in the year 2000 or some would say appointed by the U.S. Supreme Court in the year 2000. Um, it's for a history lesson. If you're not familiar with that, look it up and Google it. But uh, um, not long after Bush became president, September 11th occurred, and uh, he led us into war and eventually in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And at the same time, he was uh, uh, bulking up the Homeland Security. Homeland Security Department was formed after September 11th and all the resources for the TSA checks at the airport and, you know, uh, beefing up the airports, you know, for for uh, x-rays and things like that. All that expense happened during the early years of the Bush administration, as long with the two wars. And, and then he... Most would say unwisely, uh, implemented a series of tax cuts that culminated in 2004 with a quite a large tax cut that uh, once again favored the wealthy and and uh, so increased expenses with the war, increased expenses with homeland security, um, and decreased revenues. And so of course the our governmental surplus was wiped out and the nation found itself back in debt once again. And then the Great Recession occurs in 2008, which only further exacerbated the economic problems that were uh, that were developing uh, after after those tax cuts and during those wars. So they were supposed to those tax cuts were the Bush era tax cuts, as they were called, were supposed to expire in 2012, but uh, they were extended by Congress. Uh, Congress was quite hostile to Barack Obama, as I've mentioned previously, and and uh, so the Obama administration. Uh, uh, went along with extending those tax cuts with Congress with some modifications, uh, uh, increasing, um, really not increasing taxes so much for the wealthy as, as he wanted, but, but increasing taxes for the uh, upper middle class, at least, th uh, that kind of thing. But, you know, the wealthy can, had continued pretty much to, um, to escape increases in taxes during this period of time, even though they were the ones who benefited the most from the tax cuts in 2004. Now, of course, in 2017, um, Congress passed what has been described as the most sweeping change in the tax laws, the tax codes for 30 or 40 years, probably since the Reagan era um, under Donald Trump. And uh, it, it remains to be seen yet what the overall impact is going to be for the common working man. Once again, it's fairly clear that the upper class, um, the the uh, elites are the ones who are benefiting the most from these tax cuts. And the theory was, you know, the, the same way that uh, the Bush administration and the Reagan administration leaned heavily on trickle-down economics, so has the Trump administration, believing that or at least whether they believe it or not, it's another thing, but advancing to the public, at least this belief that uh, if we put money in the hands of the wealthy, they invest it in society and, and it'll trickle down to the rest of us because there'd be more industry, more jobs and greater wealth. Now, history shows that it doesn't happen that way, but, uh, you know, the public's willing to, uh, to believe things. And uh, even, even in the face of, um, you know, facts that, that oppose the uh, re, you know that oppose their their statements but in any event that's kind of where we are today so once again you know um it, it for instance you know there there was an early push after the 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 uh, trump 
uh, tax cuts. Um, some of some of the uh, I think Walmart, for instance, raised their their salaries with their employees, and that's what everybody that's what they were all saying was going to happen. The, that the corporations were going to you know make the uh, make our employees better and everything, and and uh, or did Walmart did, maybe didn't raise salaries but gave bonuses I think or something like that. Well, the problem with bonuses is it's a one time shot and it doesn't improve the overall um, you know the overall economic health of a of a family and so so what has happened in fact uh, that i have readily since by the sources that i'm looking at um say that uh, you know something like you know 80 percent of of the tax of the tax savings or whatever the corporations have stayed in corporation coffers have not been passed along so so U.S. social policy really relies upon three different tax structures. And um, the federal income tax, if you look on your pay stub, a lot of times it's called FIT. Um, that's, a, that's a progressive tax. And by that, by that, it means that the more money you make, theoretically, the more you pay in taxes. You have a higher tax bracket that you go into as you earn increasing money. So the, the theory is that the wealthy who are making the most money are taxed at a higher rate. Um, now, the, the income tax was established, I think it was the 16th Amendment in, in 1913. And really, um, you know, there's references in this lecture and other places to the uh, economic crises around the turn of the last century and everything. And, you know, the progressive era um, where we had some social programming implemented in the face of socialism developing around the world, um, the progressive era started around the time the income tax was established. And what it did was it gave the federal government an opportunity to redistribute some of that fabulous wealth that had been uh, developing in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, to, to more needy populations. So the, 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 the vehicle to do that income redistribution is available in the federal income tax. Now the payroll tax, uh, FICA, and I, for the off the top, it, the text says what they, those letters stand for, and I, I don't remember, but that's Social Security. And that tax is regressive in nature, and that means that the, a person making a small amount of money is taxed at the same rate as the person that makes a lot more money makes. In fact, it's so regressive that at, at a certain level, and it's something over 100000 a year right now, I believe, um, an individual is no longer taxed for Social Security. Um, one of the fix, fixes that, uh, you know, would rescue the, the uh, Social Security fund from its insolvency that so many w warn us about, one of the fixes is to raise that, that, uh, that cap to a higher level. Are, is Congress willing to do that? You know, that, that, really, re that really requires taxing wealthier people. And, and uh, you know, that hasn't, that ha we haven't gotten very far in trying to get that achieved in, you know, the last 20 years or so, at, at least. So... Um, that's that's the payroll tax. In fact, the that was established with the enactment of the Social Security Act in 1935. And uh, interestingly, and I didn't know this, but the uh, text points out that most American workers pay more in in their uh, in their Social Security deduction than they do in their income tax. I um, that surprises me, but that's what the text says. So I I guess uh, I guess. Uh, that may be the case when you figure, when you factor in refunds uh, that perhaps we get fr from uh, our tax deductions or some people get at least uh, maybe that's the case. Finally, the earned income tax credit is sort of the third leg of this of these tax structures, and this is uh, the EITC is a refundable tax credit that low wage workers can earn uh, when they have income below a certain level. And this was established during the Carter administration in 1975. The EITC is, uh, as we'll, we'll see here in a moment, is a tax benefit for lower wage workers that most or many low, lower wage workers never take advantage of. 70% of the federal tax burden is paid by the top 20% of taxpayers. Now, you have to consider that top 20 is making a lot more money, uh, so that's kind of how that happens. But their effective tax rate... 32.1% at the time that this text was published is less than a share of income. And so, so they, they do carry the bigger part of the, of the tax burden and yet proportion to their, proportionally to their income, uh, they, they don't have as big a burden as, as the common worker would have. 
course, we know that the tax code bends to special interests. And, and so the, the idea, the, the progressive uh, nature of the federal income tax is really kind of be spoiled by, by, uh, by all these loopholes and tax shelters and, and uh, deductions and things that really um, only the more well-off, financially well-off people will benefit from the poor individuals with the exception now of the EITC, but the, the deductions and the shelters in the federal income tax really benefit, again, individuals with higher levels of income and, and uh, not those that have less income. But there are some, and this is part of the what uh, what our authors like to say is a part of our welfare package. If you if you have a if you work for uh, you know employers and and certain most programs you know your retirement benefits are deducted from your pay if you have a retirement plan, are deducted from your pay pre-tax. In other words, before your tax rate is established, retirement monies that are put into a savings for you are taken out, and so you pay that tax when you withdraw that money in retirement and I'm here to tell you about that but but uh, until that time you're not taxed on it and so the theory is that it's a benefit to you because when you're in retirement you probably have a lower income and so you know theoretically your tax rate is lower I I don't find that to be the case personally but but uh, that that has uh, been sort of one of the sell jobs of <laughs> that they give the worker but but that's an example at least of uh, of uh, ways that um, the, the the income tax, you know, uh, people, you know, that are working in low-wage jobs don't have retirement funds, and so they don't have those little shelters and things. Uh, this is called a submerged welfare state in the text. And then there's, you know, pork barrel legislation where individuals, you know, that represent uh, particular areas of the nation, you know, make sure that projects that benefit their particular uh, area representation are included and get tax benefits and things like this. I mean, Ted Stevens was uh, famous. Uh, everybody in Alaska called him Uncle Ted, you know, because of all the money he brought to Alaska related to his seniority there. In addition to federal tax policies, the states have, you know, uh, the ability and and do tax. Um, well, what is it? Forty three states, I think it says, have a, have a state income tax. There are seven states that don't. Alaska being one of them, of course, as I'm sure you realize. Um, but the states have major responsibility in, in many areas of social programming, like mental health, child welfare, corrections. Now, many of those programs are supported with federal grants and federal matching funds and those kinds of things. But the federal government doesn't run those programs like it, say, it does the, uh, the TANF programs. And mind you, the, state, uh, the states still uh, administer the, the uh, public assistance, the TANF programs, ATAP in Alaska, but but uh, there's m much more in terms of federal funding with those and, and federal control in those programs. So anyway, the tax policies of your state also have a great impact on social programs and on your ability to do your job. Um, some of those states, uh, you know, fund services uh, for means other than than taxes, of course, if they don't have a state income tax. Uh, um, and, uh, it, well, you know, uh, of course, a big portion of, of uh, our state government in Alaska is is funded by uh, the permanent fund. And uh, and uh, t revenues from the oil industry, rather, I should say, not the permanent fund, but revenues from the oil industry. But from state to state, tax policies have very disparate, uh, you know, ins and outs and, and those kinds of things. And, and for instance, you know, uh, now cost of living is very different in Alabama and California. But here you can see the difference, you know, of at what earning do you start paying state income tax, you know, in the two states, how vast the difference is. And likewise, you know, there are some states that are much more generous for low income families. Um, including tax rebates and those kinds of things than other states. Um, and the table in, uh, table 9.5 in the text points, points to that. Uh, one thing I've learned as I moved from Alaska to the lower 48 was it's, a, it's a worth your time to investigate what the tax policies are in the states, even if you're not retiring. Um, but but what the tax rates are and what property taxes are like and those kinds of things because it makes a big difference in in uh, the money you see from your from your checks. 
but those higher attack states uh, hopefully will have more programs in place. I don't think that's always the case. But Now, under the Trump administration, a new federal tax code uh, limits the deductions uh, taxpayers can take for payments of state income taxes. So if you pay state income tax, uh, you've been able to deduct that amount from, uh, from your federal taxes for that year. I mean, from, from your income, rather, uh, for that year. Uh, but uh, the Trump administration's tax um, code changes uh, recently put a cap on that. I think it's $10,000 a year. And and that's a lot of state income tax, but there are many states that, um, you know, that where you would pay more than that. And incidentally, those states with the higher tax rates are the ones that have the stronger social service programs. They're also the ones that tend to... Um, well, they weren't Trump's. They weren't Trump states. They were blue states in the election. So I think it's interesting that uh, you know that that uh, the tax code seems to punish those states. But uh, through policies like the Earned Income Tax Credit, direct welfare transfers—that is, checks are being augmented with indirect expenditures through tax credits, like you get rebates and refunds and, and deductions and taxes. So that puts money in your pocket, but in a different way, again, for low, lower wage individuals. But, but the fact is, is that a large percentage of poor families that are eligible for the EITC don't claim the benefits. Many of them don't even know about it. And, and uh, if, you know, if they have a low enough income, they, they probably don't even file a, a tax return, but, um, um, Welfare workers uh, oftentimes are not familiar with the EITC either, and so they don't really tell their clients about this. And, and this is one way to help them climb out of poverty, you know, is to help them, get, help them claim tax credits that they, that they have coming to them if they do. Um, that there are other tax credits aside from the earned income credits. There's child care credits, welfare to work transition credits. Credits uh, for taking care of the elderly and the disabled, and I think this is true. Well, there may be uh, there may be an income level that cuts off where you don't get credit for that. I don't know. Um, adoption credits that's available, you know, to uh, I think pretty much any any family, you know, particularly special needs. You you can you can um, uh, deduct the expenses associated with the adoption of a child from your federal tax at least. That's how it's been. I, I I can't tell you for sure that the Trump tax codes uh, haven't eliminated that, but uh, special needs children, which are most of the children are available through the state, by the way, quite a large tax credit, not even a tax, not a deduction, but a credit taken right out of your tax payment. So you see, the thinking here is that um, tax credits could partially replace direct payments might, you know, be a way to kind of soothe the nerves of individuals who worry about where their tax monies are going and those kinds of things. But, uh, you know, it's uh, just a, that's just a thought, you know, and, and in fact, uh, um, well, as the, the authors point out, our uh, being aware of the tax codes and how tax policy is created is something that's going to be increasingly important for those of us in the profession who are working uh, in uh, with, with, poor persons and in advocacy positions. Conservative thinkers, some of these think tanks, you know, that say that since, you know, since we complain that government enriches the powerful and mistreats the, the poor, then uh, maybe we should just reform government by defunding the, the state here. It doesn't refer to the state of Alaska, but the big, the big state by defunding the state by cutting off its tax revenues and, you know, kind of forcing it into what the, they refer to, I think, in the last chapter as regalian functions. That is, you know, this is what the libertarians believe the government should do, which is not even foreign relations, but, but defense, um, funding the treasury, taking care of postal services, those basic infrastructure issues. That's, um, you know, the libertarian position. And, and so maybe maybe we should just cut uh, off tax revenues so that that's all the government does. And, and it'll be up to the individual to use that extra disposable income they'll have, theoretically, uh, to take care of themselves. But uh, one member of the Cato, which is one of those very conservative think tanks, I think that's the one that's uh, associated with the Koch brothers, uh, says that it's time to recognize that welfare can't be reformed. It should be ended. 
On the other hand, liberals believe that and, and can point in history to the unregulated capitalism and how it skews the distribution of resources and opportunity. The specific groups suffer disproportionately and suffer long-term poverty as a result of unregulated capitalism. So social programs, and, and I would add to this government intervention in such places as the work site is required. And, and I, you know, I point to you to the conditions in the nation at the turn of the last century. You know, if you've read The Jungle, you know, you, you're familiar with that. But all of those kinds of things that ultimately led to the, to the um, uh, progressive era where there were some, some form of social reforms that went on, um, at least for a period of time. Mind you, what also was going on around the world, if you remember at that time, was, uh, you know, socialism was getting a strong foothold in the nations in Europe and in Russia. You know, in 1917, socialists became the communist, overthrew the czar. Um, and and th there were concerns because of the high rate of Im uh, European immigration around the turn of the last century, my grandparents and father included in that from Hungary, that these Europeans were bringing socialism to the United States. And particularly when, you know, if you read The Jungle, you, you remember Jurgis at one point has to get on the train and goes looking for work because he can't find work in the city that will support him. And, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of the immigrants did that because that was the way they could move about. They didn't have to pay for it. They just rode boxcars. And, and the concern was that they were, instead of looking for jobs, a lot of people were worried that what they were doing was spreading socialism and spreading, you know, these kind of terrible anti-American ideas. Um, and, and so it, and Eugene V. Debs uh, ran for president during this time. And I think in 1916 got something, I could be wrong here, but I believe he got close to 10% of the popular vote in the 1916 elections. So, you know, that was a socialist candidate. And so, so there were concerns that, that uh, they needed to make some changes. And that's how some of these reforms happened. And that goes back to that, uh, that uh, idea of the pendulum swing again, when rebellion threatens, the the uh, the response is first accommodation, and then renewed denial when the force of the rebellion is dissipated. Some of this debate um, about you know taxes and everything really centers around the idea of autonomy, you know, independence, taking care of ourselves, versus government, big government, social programming, kind of taking control of our lives and making decisions for us. It's sort of the big argument against you here. And, and I'm sure that as I chuckle under my breath about that, I'm sure that a number of you have believed this, you know, that, uh, you know, the federal government uh, will be making decisions. Uh, if, if we go to universal health care about our health care that uh, we won't have control over and, you know, those kinds of things. Do you know your private insurance companies are already doing that and they're making a profit doing it. So I don't know. It's not going to be any different, but, but there's just this general mistrust of government with a capital G. And so, um, you know, less government means more disposable income in the minds of a lot of people. Um, and the authors say that voter support of tax cuts can be interpreted as a referendum on the welfare state rather than divert income to public programs through taxes. Many voters prefer to keep their income for themselves. So what about income distribution? And that's what the tax, you know, the federal income tax provides for income redistribution, taking from the rich, giving to the poor, you know, sort of a, a sort of the notion behind it. Um, and, uh, what we find is that income inequalities recently increased a great deal in the latter decades of the 20th century. This is in the wake of the Reagan revolution, you know, the, and, and uh, you know, the cutback in social services during that era. The top 20% uh, faring much better than the lower 40% in our nation. One calculation said that the top 1% claimed 53% of the growth in income in the year 2004, and that's the year of the that the uh, Bush era tax cuts were implemented as well, but that wouldn't have even been included in 2004. And so they were already doing well. And the tax cut come along and favor the rich, favoring the rich even more. So uh, this, this uh, editorial cartoon here is from actually from the Gilded Age, uh, the, the, the period of time uh, at around the turn of the 
20th century or the 19th into the 20th century, the era of the jungle and and um, Teddy Roosevelt and and uh, those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, he was the trust buster breaking up the big corporations. There was just vast wealth concentrated in the hands of very few, not unlike today. And uh, our tax policy trends now suggest that there are more benefits going to accrue to the wealthy. At least that's the way it looks. And less revenue is going to be generated to fund services for the poor. And so the authors wonder uh, if it's possible that we could find such a concentration of wealth once again that existed around the turn of the last century, that the Gilded Age. And do we have a new Gilded Age of 2.0? Upward mobility is limited for those in the lowest income households. And, and here's some statistics. You know, if, if you're in the lower income brackets, your children are likely going to stay poor, at least statistically speaking. And if you're a minority in the lower income, the chances of that are even greater. 42% of children born in the lower 20% remain there in that lower 20% in adult years. And another 42% end in the low middle to middle fifth. So they, they may grow up, climb up a couple brackets, a couple quintiles, but uh, they don't get wealthy. 17% of those born into the bottom fifth climb to one of the two top quintiles during their lifetime. So 17% get there. And maybe that sounds pretty good uh, when you think about it, but, but not if you're in the lower quintile. The odds are definitely against you. Many minority children experience downward mobility of black children born into middle income uh, parents. 45% fell to the bottom uh, quintile in this, in this one uh, period that was surveyed uh, compared to 16% of white children. And this is occurring with, with uh, many middle class families as actually right now that's been a source of some, uh, some contention in, in the elections. 54% of poor black children born into the bottom 20% remain there as compared to 31% of white children. So the 42% we first talked about was an aggregate, but here it splits it up according to uh, race. And a post-recession study, this is you know after 2008, found that 25%, about a quarter of middle-class children have fallen out of the middle class as adults compared and uh, compared to 38% of African American men. So again, you know, if you're if you're in a minority, um, you have a much tougher time even in in times that are tough for a lot of people. Now, income is one thing and that's what we oftentimes look at when we consider wealth, but really wealth isn't about income and this is something that that uh, I want to point out to you here, income and wealth are two different things. I put it in big black letters for a reason, because because um, you can have a nice high income um, and and uh, be meeting all your expenses and have a nice house and a decent car. But, you know, you have a pretty big mortgage and you've got a, a car payment or two and you're putting your kid into college, maybe. Um, you know, food prices are going up, uh, you know, kids want name brand this and you got that membership and, you know, and so on and so on. So what you find is a lot of people with high income find themselves still living paycheck to paycheck. You know, the, the American worker, uh, our capacity to, to create a savings account um, is, is uh, really very limited. And, and I think it's more than 50% of, of American workers don't have a sufficient savings to get by in times of economic uh, troubles. So so this this is, we're talking about savings here, uh, but, but uh, um, Assets really is the thing that would be your savings, but also, you know, your real estate investments and your stocks and bonds and, and other property investments. These are the indications of real wealth. And of course, 10 years ago when our economy imploded, you know, that had a lot to do in 2008. That is, you know, had a lot to do with the housing bubble where a lot of people were uh, purchased homes much, much bigger than they really could afford. But uh, the banks were eager to sell these um, these uh, high-risk mortgages um, and and uh, what happened is the homeowners found themselves underwater they couldn't sell the houses because they owed more on it than the market would demand or would allow it in order to sell um, and and so um, there's really no when when we talk about real estate we mean real estate that you have a solid investment in not one where just because you are paying a mortgage on a house it doesn't mean you're wealthy at all um, assets can be liquidated and you can turn it into money if, if you run into tough times. 
but if you don't do that you know it, it just makes more money and and this is where the one percent you know they don't have to work because their money makes money and that money makes money as well and so that's wealth now i wonder what percentage of us if, if this is a goal and certainly you know advancing economically is something that all of us go to college for, I think. I mean, some of us maybe are totally altruistic and just want to be able to, you know, participate in a meaningful uh, career where we help people. But most of us have somewhere in our minds the idea that we're going to make more money and we're going to be more comfortable ourselves while we do this. And and uh, the question is, you know, are we ever going to be wealthy? And the odds are, at least as the economy currently exists, likely not. I've I've seen elderly persons, for instance, you know, widows who have a little bit of savings, you know, and a little bit of investments and things um, when they become very sick and they have to begin to uh, use nursing homes that Medicaid's going to have to help pay for because nursing home care is so utterly expensive. Um, they have to sell off their assets in order to qualify for Medicaid insurance. And so everything that they have worked or their spouse have worked or their family saved for all those years throughout their lives is sort of the promise of the American way, right? Leave some money for your children uh, to give them a head start. That all has to get spent, put away, um, so that, uh, you know, those elderly individuals can live out their lives with a modicum of, of appropriate medical and social care. Um, why is it that uh, this current younger generation may be the first one that uh, in American history that doesn't do better as a, as a group than the prior generation? That's one of the reasons why. Asset distribution is much more skewed among the classes than income is even. And so the top 20% own more than four-fifths of the wealth. And of the lowest 20%, the asset wealth, if you figure out a number, is it's in negative territory. That means they're deep in debt. And, and this, even though we have Social Security programs and the programs of the Great Society and Medicare and Medicaid um, in the 60s and the 70s, the lowest 20% still remained in debt. And this is also skewed, of course, in, in relation to race and ethnicity, no surprise to you, and, and uh, as well as other minority groups, the disabled and and women and 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 so on so this this uh, reflects how four families have trouble buffering against economic problems and poverty the the term asset poverty is is mentioned in this text and that is the um you, it is expected or not expected but that the goal is to have enough money and savings so that you could survive three months at poverty level well that's not your goal but that's that's that would be asset poverty to have at least that much so that you could live at poverty level for three months without other income and, um, and most people don't can't reach can't reach that the wealth needed to survive three months at poverty levels exceeds income-based poverty and as i've mentioned um, ad nauseum already you know the bush tax cuts in 2004 and the great recession in 2008 just combined to widen the gap between the rich and the poor in our society today here's some figures uh from 1970 so to 2005 so we're looking at what 35 years or so there um worker wages increased 26 percent during that period of time but corporate profits increased 250 percent the median executive compensation increased 430 percent professional salaries this is lawyers and doctors and you know those kinds of things also uh, uh, increased dramatically in many sectors there's a table in the text that uh, social workers aren't included in that but i would be willing to bet you that private practice um, you know you look at look at what psychologists are earning that tells you something about what what uh, private practice social workers are probably earning as well and the number of millionaires in the United States increased f more than fivefold. So economic inequality is doomed to repeat one generation to the next in the absence of opportunities that might give the younger generation a chance for upward mobility. The nature of our intergenerational mobility in this society is much more similar to those of the developing nations that are mentioned in the text rather than uh, being similar to those in Europe. And so, uh, once again, you know, perhaps we're better off in Europe than we are in the United States. 
Now, there are some wealthy people out there with, you know, with a kind of a social conscience, Warren Buffett being one of them. I think Bill and Melinda Gates, another. Uh, Warren Buffett's always saying, you know, he can't get over the fact that he pays a lower tax rate than, than many of his employees do, including, I think he said, his secretary. It's ridiculous. And he has campaigned for higher taxes for wealthy people, and he's one of the wealthiest persons in the world. There are other people, though, other wealthy people say that economic inequalities are best rectified by encouraging the poor to look at their choices and to be more responsible, not by punishing the, the, the wealthy with higher taxes to support programs to prop those persons up. It's what you call blaming the victim. Our authors point out that, um, you know, this ideological battle is, is really much less of an issue if we have, you know, good economic times. Nobody really worries about this so much. But during a recession, when money gets tighter for everybody, it becomes uh, kind of a zero-sum game, you know, so that if one person benefits, the other person loses. And, and uh, that's a part of the problem right now. At least that's how we see our, our financial situation. And it's one of the reasons why there's so much... Uh, fighting going on over issues like social programs and taxation. Doesn't this make you think a little bit of the conflict perspective in sociology or if you want to get into historical, uh, you know, thoughts, uh, Marxist theory about, uh, you know, about socialism, you know, that uh, really what happens is the groups are struggling um, for control of limited resources in every, in any society. So, at least if you go along with the Keynesian theory, you know, in an era of recession and slow growth um, that we're experiencing or have been experiencing, at least since the recession, welfare philosophy suggests that expansion of government benefits and increased government spending is the thing to do. Government should put more money out there in, in the economy. Uh, but conservatives in Congress have fought against this very successfully, um, and particularly with the uh, extremes of the Tea Party. Uh, holding a lot of things up in Congress as far as compromise is concerned. So what happens is the taxpayers are pitted against the tax consumers and the payers are populated by those who are of influence and in control. Remember something that I think we talked about very early in the semester, that one way to uh, maintain strong control on the part of a leader is to get groups uh, under the leader's purview fighting with each other and that seems to be what's going on in our society and and uh, we're not paying attention to what's going on above us so the result is a vicious cycle where federal assistance is choked off the needy are left to fend for themselves and antagonism increases across class social and ethnic lines Carger and his uh, Stokes, his his co-author, um, point out at the end of this chapter that you know we we need to do, to be aware of uh, when we're look, talking about social justice and social advocacy, not just focused on health and human services and social programs, but also look at tax policy. And we need to become very fluent in tax policy. This is something that uh, you know I have a lot to learn in myself, and and uh, I encourage you to get engaged in learning about this. So I. I mentioned at one point, you know, that I think not only is it important to, you know, to get exposed to other other thoughts in other fields like sociology, psychology, you know, and, and those kinds of things, but, but uh, in clinical treatment, you know, those kinds of things, but also get some classes in economics, try to get some classes in, in finance, perhaps, because these are things that are going to be very helpful to you in your in your capacity to advocate for your clients. Knowing how to leverage tax policy to advance social justice requires some sophistication in social policy and also connections from the sounds of things. You know, it also has something to do with, you know, making making connections with the right people that understand the parliamentarian process and know how to work the system to get things changed. It isn't enough to have big big ideas and new ideas and good ideas. You got to know how to get them implemented. You not you got to know. You got to have enough connections to know where to put them, and if that if that's kind of depressing to you, I think that's that's an important thing to learn. You know, we just we have to know that's true, and and as I say here, it's not a sin to connect to people of influence in our system. 
understand that there are two streams of poverty in in and poverty policy rather two streams in poverty policy in the United States the public welfare stream which is legislated through social security and associated programs that's the health and human services programs but also the tax credits that are enacted through the EITC and the other tax credit programs we had talked about uh, a few slides back treasury and federal reserve manage those tax credits not HHS so so don't just work HHS look at other departments in in the federal government also when you when you're thinking about advocacy we have to realize that poverty policy involves more than just public welfare policy but also involves tax pol tax policy options and we have to learn to master the financial procedural and accounting aspects of policy and its relationship requirements as well okay that's all for for uh, this chapter and I hope you found some interesting things in here I think there's a lot to think about in this material and and I hope you'll take some time to reflect on it thanks <laughs>